uh, surgical outcome and do um, it does talk about what's new in the field of glaucoma surgeries and the MIGS so I think Dr. Minakshi Dhar is not there so we'll, she'll, she'll just be joining us so we'll begin with the first talk by Dr. Debashish who will be talking about incorporating latest glaucoma surgical devices Dr. Debashish Okay, so I think Dr. Debashish is not there. Do we have Dr. Lippi? Okay, so we, I think Sahiban, we'll start with you. So we'll have uh, Dr. Sahiban talk about angle detangle, 10 things I would uh, wish to know before I start my MIGS surgery. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So I'm here to talk about what one should necessarily know before starting their MIGS journey. So according to me, choosing the right patient is the most important aspect of starting your MIGS journey. So we all know that the best patients are mild to moderate open angle glaucomas who, in whom that you need a pressure reduction of um, uh, let's say um, 10 millimeters or so. So the target IOPs should be somewhere around mid to high teens. And also specifically MIGS is designed for those patients who have difficulty in taking their medications, who have side effects or compliance issues. However, contraindications of MIGS are also there. Uh, it cannot be uh, done in uh, juvenile open angle glaucomas, all forms of secondary glaucomas. It is not, all the devices that are available for MIGS are not licensed to be used in primary angle closure glaucoma. The next most important thing would be adequate pre-op assessment. And I cannot emphasize enough that um, when we say that MIGS applies to mild to moderate open angle glaucoma, we mean that the staging is done only on the basis of visual fields and not on the basis of how high the IOP was or how many anti-glaucoma medications the patients was on. Also, it's important to remember the fact that the inability of MIGS to bring down the pressures to very low teens uh, also limits its use in advanced glaucomas and normal tension glaucomas, at least the, uh, uh, the MIGS procedures that are available in India. Also, in the pre-op assessment, be very sure to rule out uh, any corneal opacities, haziness. Uh, ensure that you have a very crisp view of the angle. The angle is devoid of any peripheral anterior sinicae. Also, um, so now I think I have changed my practice from doing MIGS post cataract surgery to doing MIGS any form before the cataract surgery because instances like these also happen where at the end of cataract surgery you encounter corneal edema and there could be hyphema with your attempt on starting the MIGS and then the angle uh, view is absolutely zero and you cannot proceed and there are times that you may need to abandon the MIGS procedure. Also take a very good history of patients being on uh, blood thinners and take uh, uh, measures intraoperatively accordingly. It's also very important to familiarize yourself with the correct positioning of uh, MIGS patients. So MIG, uh, for MIGS, the, the surgeon is sitting, sitting temporally. The patient's head is turned 35, 45 degrees away from the surgeon and the microscope is tilted 35 to 40 degrees towards the surgeon. The kind of view that you want to get is the on fast view wherein you have three distinguished bands of trabecular meshwork, scleral spur and ciliary body band. But when the uh, position of the patient is not adequate or the angulation of the microscope is not angulate, uh, is not accurate, you may have a uh, trabecular meshwork, uh, scleral spur and ciliary body band blend with each other and these three uh, structures, they become indistinguishable from each other. So this is the kind of view that you get when the patient's head is not til uh, uh, tilted enough or the microscope is not tilted enough. This is called an anti-mix stance. But you can notice that as soon as the patient's head is tilted further away, which is usually the case to position them properly, 
the angle becomes uh, very clearly visible with all the three structures very distinguishable. Also proper understanding of the angle structures is very important. Over here you can see that the red arrow points at the level of the trabecular meshwork and the black arrow points at the level of the uh, root of the iris of the ciliary body band. This video is being played with permission from the primary surgeon who wishes to be anonymous. And uh, you can see that the bang procedure is being performed at the level of the root of the iris which probably explains the bleeding in the cyclodialysis cleft that ended up happening. Uh, so the proper uh, understanding of angle structures is something one has to be familiar, uh, familiar with before starting their mixed journey. Also make sure that you have very clear corneal incisions because you don't want uh, bloody incisions which enter the anterior chamber and obscure your view of the angle. Use very good cohesive viscoelastics. I prefer to use sodium hyaluronate 1.4 because uh, it deepens the anterior chamber, it keeps it stable. No matter how many times you go in and out, uh, the, an the anterior chamber does not fluctuate. It gives you a brilliant view of the angle and also see how uh, well it fits on top of the uh, cornea. It doesn't flow out, it just sits there. That's how viscous it is. It also limits the reflux bleeding that may happen during mixed procedures. So you can see the brilliant view of the angle that it gives. And also avoid tendency uh, to fill the anterior chamber with viscoelastic lest you may have problems like this, iris prolapse, it becomes a messy surgery thereafter. In the end, uh, don't overpromise. Uh, always tell the patients that we will combine this with your cataract surgery and that will probably lengthen the time of your FACO. We are trying to get you uh, off a few drops or reduce the uh, IOP uh, the intraocular pressure postoperatively for you. I describe it to my patients as a way to open the natural drainage system of the eye, like unclogging a sink drain. Also, as far as the postoperative medications are concerned, the regimen remains the same as cataract surgeries. But my method would be to stop all anti-glaucoma medications right after surgery because you want to see how much of IP reduction the uh, surgery per se is bringing. And since these patients, they have good nerve reserve, they are mild to moderate open angle glaucomas, they can, uh, it, it's okay to experiment in them over a month with a stepwise increment in anti-glaucoma medications if required. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saiban, for a nice presentation. I just wanted to know how's the, uh, I mean, how does these implants work in an eye which has had an SLT or an ALT? So uh, you can't, ma'am. Uh, first of all, they have uh, the implants you're talking about, the eye stent implant. No, so I wouldn't suggest it in the area of SLT, but then yes, of course, if there are areas which are spared of the SLT, I think that's the advantage of the stent because uh, uh, because it's so less invasive, it requires only you know two clock hours to be implanted. You have the whole trabecular meshwork to uh, play with. But on the area of the treated SLT, it should not be implanted. But very to difficult identify to identify, yes. Also yes. that. Yeah, because you know, once you've so, done, you can't, yeah. you usually do either 180 degrees yeah. or maybe 360, so it's difficult to SLT know. Leaves There'll no be no more. skip areas. Yeah. But yeah. there are studies that have actually uh, studied uh, eye stent uh, on previously treated eyes with SLT, but they weren't very specific on whether that same treatment area was where the implant was placed or other areas. I'm assuming it is other areas, it doesn't really make sense because if you're delivering laser, you're actually also damaging, Scarring. you know, the ability of the Schlem's canal to open up beyond that. I think every surgeon has their preference of doing the SLT. Uh, usually they do it 180, yeah, 180 inferiorly. Yes. So uh, we know that uh, this area we have done SLT. So try to skip that area and uh, place the eye stent. And, and, and uh, I mean, when you are deciding that you are going to put an eye stent, it is usually you start with one or do you prepare sometimes to put multiple? No. No, the generation one has got one implant in the injector. Generation two, the eye stent inject has got two implants in the same injector, which will go in the same patient. Two clock hours apart. So it's more effective, the generation two. But yeah, it's more costly also. But eye stent gen one also works very well. I've done almost 12 now and uh, it, it's it's working very well. One last question before we wind up. So what is the, I mean, biggest challenge that one can have and biggest problem which one can land in after 
See, the, the biggest challenge is, I think, our mental block. And the counseling of the patient is very important. Counseling of the patient, telling them why we are doing this and what is the next step. If this doesn't work, trabeclectomy, which is a more invasive surgery where we have to put another incision, we have to put sutures. So show them the future. If your glaucoma progresses, this is what we'll have to do. And uh, tell them about, because you are in the initial stages of glaucoma, you have mild to moderate glaucomas. This is and you are undergoing a cataract surgery. This is what we can do to slow down the progression so that in your lifetime you don't get uh, a trab or a tube done. Uh, you don't land up with a trab or a tube. So counseling of patient in that way, the patient understands and tell them that if we are already going in for the cataract surgery. It's hardly a five minute, seven minute procedure that and the recovery is very quick. The worst thing that can happen during the surgery is you don't implant it properly, right? So with generation one, if it is under implanted, or if it is not implanted properly, you go hold it back and just besides where you had planned initially, implant it. It's plain and simple. Uh, you not can pick it up and re-implant You it can now. easily pick it up and re-implant. I think for the first few surgeries, it's a good idea to keep a backup. No, but uh, yes, over implantations and under implantations are a known, uh, uh, you know, learning curve challenge that one can have. Yeah, usually but with the generation one, you won't have an over implantation. You can have an under implantation, but not an over implantation. But like Saiba told, over implantation can happen with generation two. Yeah. Uh, they inject. And if that happens, that's the worst thing that can happen. But again, it will not cause any harm. You have to let go of the implant. Right, it's so small, it's so tiny, it'll go in the supracoratal supraciliary space, and it's not going to cause any harm. The uh, they will they will provide a backup generation one with a generation two. So if one implant is over implanted, you have lost that implant. You can implant a generation one instead of it. So that's the worst thing that can happen. pupil before you put the I used to but now I stopped doing it so it, it suppose it, it it can't go beyond the I mean behind the iris it, it won't get lost <laughs> <laughs> no no yeah but initially yes to uh, elevate your uh, uh, apprehensions uh, put uh, pilocarpin constrict the pupil uh, my first case I sent inject uh, the first implant was under implanted I picked it up with the micro access forceps, brought it out, re uh, uh, thread it in the injector and Bend implanted it. No, no, it was uh, in the angle itself, but under implanted. So you have to check it after the yeah. surgery. Uh, those are the steps that has to be done. I think it's nice to tap it once you've injected mm -hmm. it to establish it's that it's loose. sitting well. Yeah, it's, it's required. You can even push it a little in further to make sure that it's not under implanted. Yeah, so also, because you have a very cohesive viscoelastic, the implant is never really free floating like that. The kind of uh, movements that you find with just HPMC. So, if it's there, it just falls right there only that you can rethread and put it back. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that it'll come out. It, it is loose. It'd be interesting to suck it in. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dr. Paul Soni, who will be speaking about improving outcome of tabeclectomy. Do we improve the outcomes of glaucoma filtering surgery? I think trabeculectomy is one of the commonly performed uh, surgeries in eye except for the cataract surgery and everybody does the uh, trabeculectomy uh, though it appears very simple but we all know that we can land up in problems many a times and we have a lot of um, intraoperative challenge, challenges that we are faced with and many a time we land up with a lot of post-operative complications also so I would like to briefly um, run you through what are the steps that one can incorporate during the surgery to have to have better outcome of the uh, trabeculectomy. All right. So uh, I think what all our patients want after trabeculectomy is good vision with with minimum medication and a comfortable eye. And what we all glaucoma surgeons aim for is a nice filtering bleb with good intraocular pressure control 
without any medication starting from one day post operative to years beyond the surgery and what we actually don't want is any kind of complications and whenever we are talking about complications most is the side threatening complications like the suprachoroidal hemorrhage the wipe out phenomenon and in long term follow we don't want leaking blebs or a bleb failure and i think all of you would agree that the most important cause of all these complications is the hypotony which happens during the surgery and it's the suddenness of hypotony the duration of hypotony and the extent of hypotony which is very important which can land you up in these post operative complications so it is very important for all of us to identify the high risk eyes which are more prone to develop these complications especially the ones who have very advanced visual field defects and a macular split or a very advanced glaucomatous scupping because these are the patients who are more prone to develop uh, post operative complications so i think a thorough pre operative assessment is something which is very very important we should know the eye that we are going to operate upon and i think all of us want a pristine untouched cornea but many a times we are dealing with secondary glaucomas and we have scarred corneas which can have scarred conjunctiva which can have aggressive wound healing which are thin and inflamed so it is a good idea to check for the mobility of the conjunctiva with a wetted sponge before you are planning for the surgery now again these patients are on anti glaucoma medication for a very very long time and we know that all of these cause a lot of blepharitis so it's a good idea to put the patient on copious lubricating drops give patient a drug holiday and especially when we are talking about pg analogs pilocarpine and ripatec it's a good idea to stop these drops 3 to 7 days prior to surgery put the patient on anti glaucoma medication and sometimes if you feel that the surface is highly inflamed it's a good idea to put the patient on some kind of low dose steroid 1 to 2 weeks prior to trabeculectomy now again we know that extreme degree of myopia or hyperopia can land you up in problems so if patient have high myopia you can have thin and elastic flaps and these can overfilter and you can have bleb related problems on the other hand hyperopes are more prone to develop uh, mis aqueous misdirection and post operative shallow ac so a meticulous suture suturing and a meticulous closure is required in high hyperopes so you have to be careful in these cases now once you have done a, a good uh, ocular assessment it's a good idea to know about the systemic control also do a good blood pressure control and if the patient is on anticoagulants stop the anticoagulants to avoid any kind of intraoperative bleeding and it will also help you with post operative suture lysis or if you are planning for a suture removal because if you have a large subconjunctival hemorrhage then suture uh, lysis will be very difficult now again diabetics we know have very high levels of anti vegf and they have aggressive scarring so it's a good idea to use anti mitotic agents in these particular patients and be prepared what you are going to expect now once you've planned the surgery before surgery it's good idea to have a good intraocular pressure control so always control the controllables operate upon a soft eye what i do is to give pre operative mannitol 30 to 60 minutes before surgery do remember to give patient a bathroom break because last thing you would like if patient is on the operating table and trying to you know pass urine and squeezing and straining and you're not able to focus on the surgery so give patient bathroom break this is very important and use as low volume of, of peribulbar anesthesia as possible no super pinky is something which is very very important and use a light weight speculum to avoid any kind of positive vitreous pressure now the area where we are going to operate you said you should have as maximum exposure as you want especially if you are planning for a valve surgery and now we all have shifted from a superior rectus traction suture to a corneal traction suture but with corneal traction suture also take care that you avoid any full thickness entry or too superficial an entry because that can lead to cheese wiring again avoid too big a bite because that can lead to flap distortion and a difficult dissection Uh, now handling conjunctiva is something which is very very important conjunctiva is a sacred tissue for all glaucoma surgeons so be gentle with the conjunctiva use plain forceps rather than a serrated forceps hold tenons as far as possible and use sponges and uh, try to make as sufficient peritomy as possible don't make too big a peritomy and too small also it should be adequately sized and as far as possible avoid nasal blebs because they are associated with frequent delen formation and can give rise to lot of dysesthesia in the post operative period now younger patients often have thick tenons so a complete dissection of tenons is important because this can inter this can cause a lot of post operative scarring and can also interfere with flap dissection 
Uh, intraoperatively, again, we have to take care that uh, coagulate all the bleeders, be gentle with your cautery, don't over cautery, don't use um, uh, too lesser cautery because you don't want a lot of bleeding also, but excessive cautery we know that can lead to fo vocal scleral thinning and bleb leak, so you have to be careful. And again, now antimetabolite and mitomycin has kind of become a routine for all uh, glaucoma surgeries. So whenever we are applying antimetabolites, make the area as big as possible use multiple sponges, take care that you're avoiding the edges of conjunctiva, go as posterior as possible, and the time and the concentration of mitomycin can be dependent on the, uh, the type of case the, uh, that you are operating upon. And at the end, irrigate very nicely so that you do, uh, don't, especially if you're doing a combined surgery, that you don't leave any mitomycin in there. Now Moorefield uh, uh, surgical technique has shown us beautifully that posterior flow is very important to have to avoid overhanging blebs which can uh, create a lot of problems and it's a good idea to leave one millimeter of sclera when you're making a scleral flap so that you have as posterior flow as possible. Now I think sclerostomy is the crux of uh, trabeculectomy and whenever we are doing a sclerostomy it's a good idea that you place your side port before that. This is something which is very, very important. Pre-place your apical suture if you want. You should always release your traction suture whenever you are going in for sclerostomy. And one thing which is very important in order to avoid any kind of complications, that hypotony needs to be avoided. Now this is the most important step where you don't want to lose the anterior chamber and have hypotony because if you have hypotony, there is immediate increase in the ciliary body volume and patients can have shallow anterior chamber in the post-operative period. So it's a good idea to inject either air or BSS or viscoelastic, whatever you are comfortable with from the side port before, before you are doing a sclerostomy. Now again, you have to have an adequate size sclerostomy and it should not be too anterior or too posterior. You can use vanas or trifine, whatever you are comfortable with. And once you have done sclerostomy, you have to do an adequate sized uh, peripheral idotomy so that you don't have any blockage of the sclerostomy opening. I'll just be quickly summing up. So uh, once you have done the sclerostomy, we know that wound closure is something which is again very, very important. So I think TRAB, you know, each and every step is important. And if you miss a step, you can land up in problems. So you have to be focused and paying attention to each and every step. We know that the blebs which are sealed well, they heal well and they swell well. And again, scleral flap suture, you can, uh, it's very, very important that you have a watertight wound closure. You can go in for either a releasable suture or you can plan for a laser suture lysis later on. Check for the si side port leakage and if possible repair them. Now conjunctival closure again is very important depending on phonics or limbus based suture you can use a vicryl running suture or you can put uh, single uh, interrupted sutures on the flap. Now again repair all the wounds intraoperatively only especially if there's a buttonhole and if you are in doubt you can use fluorescent to check the wound leakage. Now post-operatively, I think it's a good idea to put the patient on steroid and slightly long-term steroids up to three months. That's what I do to prevent early uh, bleb failures. And again, if you have done a su uh, releasable suture, you can go in for suturalysis, especially if the pressures are high starting from one week post-operatively or do a laser suturalysis depending on what kind of suture you have placed. This is something which I usually tell, teach all my patients is digital massage, which is um, described as Carlo Traverso Maneuver, in which patients are taught to do gentle massage on the, um, in the eye, on the globe, especially on the area opposite to the bleb, so that the bleb continues to be there and continues to uh, function nicely. And I've seen that this shows good results in maintaining the successful outcome of trabeculectomy. So I think each and every step is important and you have to do careful pre-planning, make tailor-made decision, as we know that every patient is unique and give, a, give every patient a diligent post-operative care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Parun, for summarizing. I'm extremely sorry I got caught in the traffic and I'm Dr. Meenakshi. And uh, each of the things that she elucidated uh, is very, very important, I think, uh, are we having discussions while the topic is on? It I makes more correct. sense. Any questions for, from anybody? Yeah.
releasable sutures are more often i think everybody would accept a releasable sutures is the way most people do it yeah 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 that's right so what i i also use a teno vicryl absorbable so i would put one monofilament uh, interrupted one releasable and one teno vicryl so the releasable is at the apex so that that I, you want your blood to go posteriorly so and it still sponges uh, not not injection still and you want the blep to go posteriorly, so you would want your releasable to be the apex one. So the one which is uh, down, you don't want, if you're uh, made your incision to the right side, that's where you generally will make, then the right suture will be the monofilament because you don't want to remove that. And the nasal one would be a bike which will get absorbed. And also I, I usually do is I put a, uh, I mean, fixed epic suture and put two releasable on the side. Oh. And they also work pretty well, you know. And you leave little bit of, you know, sclera on the sides of the uh, scleral flap. And I, yeah. I think yeah. everything works. Sutralizer also works well, but I agree with you. Releasables are far more easier to manipulate and you can trim them. Also coming to mitomycin C injections, I've started doing them, but I still don't do it in every patient, especially in eyes where the conjunctiva, I'm not sure on the table what it'll look like. I want to have the ability to change my concentration duration depending upon the touch and feel of the conjunctiva I get. So the eyes where the eyes inflamed a lot and you know that the conjunctiva might not be as healthy and thick, the tenons is not there. Those patients I still don't inject and I don't inject on the table. I inject in the preoperative area. So about a few hours before, but it's also very relatively recent. So I don't know whether I'll find a significant difference in the two groups. I guess time will tell that. How Actually, there are sorry, sorry. zero point How one mm, and I still stick. Actually, to there are so many variables with TRAB itself that each of these steps you need to uh, do a change, make one change, and see what your outcomes are. Then make another change and. Um, so we can't, uh, and each to their own, like for me, I find uh, rectangular uh, uh, sections better, another person may find triangular. So whatever works for somebody's hand, it's just that the principles are the same. And when we are putting, the, there's a difference between the way we tie sutures for a corneal section and the way we tie sutures for a scleral flap. We need to make it a little slanting and we don't have to make it a tight suture whether whether it's a releasable or a non-releasable because our uh, we want to ha ensure that there is some flow of the fluid yeah, and I, I just wanted to add one more thing you know sometimes it's a good idea if you're in doubt that whether the releasable suture is going to get released because sometimes you know they get caught and you are not able to release them and they tighten actually so it's a good idea to check it on the table that whether they are working fine and then you can re-tighten it and leave it because Even sometimes I you, used know, to, you, uh, have, you put a releasable and you, uh, you, know, you try to remove it and it breaks, it doesn't get. Even I used to do the same thing, uh, uh, the two side sutures used to be releasable, then, but then I realized that uh, if I need to release the second releasable, by the time I'll have to do some amount of uh, needling as well. So uh, in most of the cases, that's so I started uh, taking a interrupted suture, the left side suture as an interrupted suture. And uh, when I need to remove that, I do a bit of subconjunctival needling and then knock off the suture with the needling itself. So, yeah. so use time. More, uh, like I just differ a little as far as using mannitol is concerned. I don't think that uh, I prefer to give it on the table. And uh, if need be, uh, yes, uh, there can be a, an issue of a full bladder, but that can also be tackled on the table itself and let them go and uh, be. Uh, ha not have a uh, have an empty bladder when they are lying down because I f uh, I feel that when we give an IV mannitol rapidly uh, the action that it takes best is within the next 15 to 20 minutes and after half an hour actually there is a, a rebound uh, count it becomes counterproductive. I, I, I will not I'm not sure. I, I don't know. Wait. I give it maybe hours before. Yes, yes, I give because it. Because the more they urinate and all the stress, yes, they go absolutely. up and then they come so, down. Because many the times intraoperative, you know, you have to wait till the time the sex of marriage is meant to come and maybe you have to rush it really fast. And uh, for the I full bladder, tried, but in the I clinic, OPD also when you give mannitol, sometimes yeah, it takes doesn't come. Few hours for the pressures to come down. For the full bladder, ma'am, I've. Uh, 
if if i are giving more than 100 cc of manitol uh, i uh, tell them to wear and we have kept adult diapers with uh, yeah, or even uh, catheterized i've i've had a patient who ended up with a retrobulbar hemorrhage a young man and uh, uh, he had been having 60 70 and then we brought the pressure down and unfortunately for him he ended up with a retrobulbar hemorrhage the first day we took him so we actually released the blood and all that and two days later when we took him up we and i told him that i am going to bring down the iop with the the thing on the table we started giving it before and we catheterized the patient and it went off fine there was no trouble as far as the i was concerned and i pressure was controlled we have actually so, started using uh, na, uh, manitol manitol uh, and all patients above 60 we give diaper yeah that's a good idea yeah so that Yes, generally, or anyone. Do you give diapers? No, no. Diapers. 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 So diapers. that there's no problem about them having to be worried. Plus, that soiling of the OT doesn't. Ideas. No, no, no. no. Diapers. 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 They make them wear a diaper on. Their Adult own. diapers. <laughs> She's wondering what yeah. scientific thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on to the next topic. Okay. So I am um, I'm Dr. Prashant Shivasta. I'll be speaking about oops in glaucoma and overview of com- surgical complications and their management. So most of the top most of the, uh, things are already discussed in the last presentation. So I'll briefly discuss uh, the complications and their early management. So complication can be of two types: intraoperative and postoperative complications, um, in which early and late postoperative com- complications. So the first complication, which could be a conical buttonhole, which is already dealt, uh, discussed by ma'am, that we have to use a a non tooth forceps to, uh, to prevent such uh, button holing and if a button hole is small we can leave it if it is larger then we can close it by a tensile nylon or tensile vacuum suture and generally they do very well so we can close it like this uh, next is scleral flap flap damage this can also happen so now we have to see uh, at what stage we have a scleral flap damage or what is the extent of the damage if the damage is a small of, of small amount then we can repair it on the table Uh, there only, and if it is larger, and we have created a, a surgical, and also we have to see whether we have created a, 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 a sclerostomy or not. If not, then we can move on to uh, some other site, and we can patch the the, the area with scleral patch graft to see if the graft if the damage is more. So I'll I'll share a video. I'll show a video which can explain the procedure. So vitreous loss can also ha- ha- can happen in ophthalmic eyes and eyes with uh, aphasia and post trauma. In such cases, anterior vitreostomy may be required. now bleeding as as dr parul has already discussed the how to prevent bleeding in in a case of uh, uh, while performing a trap we have to stop anticoagulant 5 days before the surgery and also we have to um, give the maximum control of iop manitol uh, should be given in all cases in such a way a uh, bleeding can be avoided so pre operative we have to identify the risk factor discontinuation of anticoagulants at intra operative we can use an uh, bromoindine or aprocolindine and we have to minimize the handling of tissue we have to be very gentle and we have to maintain the intraocular uh, pressure while doing the surgery and once a supracoroidal hemorrhage is suspected we have to close all the wound immediately and try to form the uh, form the ac flat chamber uh, can uh, can happen in supracoroidal hemorrhage and in such case management will be the closing the uh, sealing the all the wounds completely no i told him that he's wanted now this is a surgical video which uh, explains how the uh, how the scleral uh, flap tear is managed this was a small tear So uh, it's a combined phaco tra- phaco uh, in which uh, so a crescent is used to uh, so uh, to increase uh, the uh, to enhance the fl- flap size. So now we can see the next step. There is a small tear. Well, so this uh, this tear is formed in the, in the sclera. So what what is the next step? So we go deeper uh, in the sclera. So a next plane is selected. We go deeper, and sclerostomy is done anterior to that uh, that area which is affected. and the rest of and that and the rest of steps are similar to that of the normal uh, normal trabectomy the defect is closed by tensile nylon suture and this this patient uh, did very well so it's a small tear which can be uh, repaired very easily so next uh, next complication which i would show is uh, premature entry so this is a case of childhood glaucoma in which this these eyes are really uh, bigger eye so the sclera is very thin So in ophthalmic eye sclera, very thin. It's difficult to make us uh, flap sometimes because of thin. So this is sclera is very thin here, and while do, uh, making the flap, there premature entry happened. And then what? What is the next step? We form the anterior chamber, and then further, uh, and after placing the pre uh, pre placed suture, then the PI is done at different site, and then the wound is closed. 
So the conjunctiva is closed now. So this patient also did very well. Uh, now next, coming to the post-operative complications. So in the view of time, I have only uh, I will seeing only two two, uh, two cases. So this is a 54 year female which had a, who had a primary operating glaucoma and got a IP on maximum AGM. So trib MC was tried on third post-op day. So uh, the wound is leaking, and again the serial test was positive here, and wound is leaking. So it's a case of a wound leak, which is very common complication of a limbal uh, well, phonics based uh, tabectomy. So the first, once you see there is a, a wound leak, the eye should be patched, and we can see the patient next day. Uh, so the patient was uh, seen on the third day, the, and I was patched and called fourth day. The leak was still present, then a large side BCL, generally 14 to 16 millimeter. 16 millimeter is ideal, is applied, and then we can follow the patient. So the 60 millimeter uh, BCL is very much helpful in closing the such uh, uh, conjunctival wound leak. So generally management is conservative, we can patch the eye. Uh, if there is no response, then BCL and tissue adhesive can be tried. The second case is a case of over filtering blebs, a 62 years ma uh, male patient with uh, uh, in which a phaco tabectomy is done. The first day, post first post-op day, the IOP was very good with a deep anterior chamber. Uh, wherever the cell, seventh post-op day, IOP was high with shallow bleb. So a release, uh, releasable uh, suture was removed, blade formed on the table, was uh, looking very good, but when the patient returned on 10th post of day, there was hypertony with shallow anterior chamber. We can see in the certain picture, the shallow amperature with a big, uh, large diffuse blade. So this is a case of over filtering blade, where we have a shallow anterior chamber, low IOP, but there is no leak. There is no, it's not a blade leak, it's a over filtering blade. So uh, to deal with over filtering blade, we, uh, uh, so we uh, the low uh, loose scleral flap is the reason, and if you remove the visible suture very early in post-op period, then the, you can have such uh, such scenario. The management is giving cycloplegia, pressure patching. In the cases which are not responding to this, we can try deepening the anterior chamber viscoelastic or non-expansive concentration of gas. Larger, uh, if the the hypertonic persists for longer time, then we can have a supracoital effusion. Then we have to sometimes drain or we may have to start steroid for uh, for for the uh, for the, uh, three or four weeks. Now this is a late post-op complications. Uh, complication that we have a cystic blame. So such cystic blame, if rupture, there is impending rupture, then we can do a conjunctival rotograft, and sometimes if the sclera is also very thin, they can put a patch graft. So I have shared only few complications uh, in the interest of time. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for those few beautiful presentations and the videos. Now, the last patient that had overfiltration, um, did you do anything to the steroids? You know, because initially you had good, uh, the pressure was high. At the time that the eye started overfiltering, did you lower the steroid? Because sometimes if you reduce the steroid, you may have a bit of adhesion you know the inflammation then helps and that can also reduce it and then do you also consider transconjunctival suturing when you have overfiltration in such cases i find that a lot easier even maybe better than injecting viscoelastics and all that because once you do that the pressure goes up and then yeah. you seal off the hypotony thank you I will uh, suture sometimes can have a tendency to cheese wire over time. So okay. you have to be careful. I mean, you will end up using a tenon um, yes, nylon, and sometimes yes. they can cheese wire, especially if the conjunctiva is very thin and you've applied mitomycin C. Okay. So then those become a challenge. And I've seen mm -hmm. two such cases where you have this really sharp vertical cut through the bleb and they're leaking through it. You okay, release again, it, but so yeah. You so you have to be careful. Only an in um, invasive procedure required. But the first. Uh, a technique is to try and manage it medically. Very yes. often it does settle down. So and steroids, do you think uh, the steroids, yes. Yes, tapering the steroids help. Yeah, right, thanks. Yeah, it, I, I think more for uh, wound leaks than for overfiltering blebs because the pressure onto the bleb area with these bandage contact lenses is not good enough for the filtration to slow down. But for the uh, leaks, it leaks works fairly works well. well. It works fairly well. I am not, uh, I don't shy away from resuturing the conjunctiva if I can see a gap because sometimes the longer you let the uh, bleb leak be there, the future of that bleb is not so good. 
these blebs scar down much earlier. So really doing something very quickly to try and fix the leak is very helpful to maintain long, the longevity of your blab. The bleb. I have a question. Uh, I used to do traps, standalone traps under an air bubble in the entry chamber. Now I've shifted to viscoelastic. Uh, what, what does the panel do? What viscoelastic do you use? Uh, normal viscomet. So I yes. use only sodium hyaluronate for the reason that I don't overfill the chamber or fill it completely, but a very little amount so that you don't have the hypotony and very significant fluctuations. And it's very easy to press the scleral lip and it pops off because it's so uh, cohesive and not dispersive. So I only use that. With methyl cellulose, the reaction in the eyes, the inflammation that it generates is so much that your blebs tend to behave differently with methyl cellulose. So I don't use that at all. I try and stick to fluid and air. Rarely, if I really need high risk patients and all, I use sodium hyaluronate and I pretty much on the table make sure that it has come out while I'm checking for my filtration. That's my technique. What I, think I do is I, after I the scleral suturing, I do an INA complete INA and uh, then I suture the conjunctiva. The yeah, because I think it's very will important. Always, yeah, in, sorry, it yeah, will this, always induce some amount of Yeah, so there's a lot of inflammation. one of the others, it won't. Right. So yeah. viscomet. So it's better to use a sodium hyaluronate like methyl or even a methyl cellulose I, especially. I prefer a boil, yeah. talking about a cohesive, I prefer a dispersive. Okay. okay. And then I don't have to wash it. It's more difficult to wash off, but it takes care of those micro leaks for a uh, yeah. few days. It's but, a personal yeah. choice which you'll finally... But you have to remember that the pressures in that case will be a little high initially and it'll automatically get better. I'm sure you see that because of that retained little bit, but they don't cause right. inflammation. And I think be careful if you're leaving an air bubble in a fake eye. Never. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And even so I, I, I have shifted I from air bubbles yes. now. Yeah. Even high air visco is not easy even with a bimanual. And not good for a fake eye. I mean, you don't want to. So of we course. try and not even enter the anterior chamber much, except for using the fluid which is going to the chamber and right. check for filtration. Nothing really enters into the pupillary area. Yeah, she has. Sorry. So the panel, um, the cause of the problem in the last patient was because of the early removal of releasable. What time do you think is ideal to take it out? I what has worked for you? Yeah, so it depends on how many sutures do you have in place, what kind of mitomycin C have you used and what pressures are you seeing in the post-operative period. Normally releasables we don't touch in the first week, 10 days, but there are some situations where it's super tight and you on the table are also having problem with filtration and you put three releasables and all, sure you can go ahead and release one if you're sitting in 35, 36, you can do that, but otherwise after week 10 days in the first few days a little bit of massage and all you can give, that helps you deal over the pressure fluctuations. Okay. And what about um, when you have uh, a high pressure in uh, assessing your patient, when do you think it's safe to do gonioscopy to see whether it's the osteum that is blocked? Do you think it's something you can try yeah. second day post-op? Immediately, yeah. yes. So if you have high pressures post-op, you want to know the cause. Yeah. Thank you. So you would, if, if it's in the so second or third one. post-op day that you're seeing, you, most probably because of your osteum getting blocked. Yes. Okay. So you need to do a gonioscopy to check. Thank you. See, Thank you I think I think it's a good idea to you know do some massage and see if the yes. bleb is forming, the pressure is getting released. That means the ostium is working fine, and then you can plan for an early suture removal starting from one week postoperatively. Wait till that time. But if the pressures are still continuing to hide despite massage, you know there's a blockage in the ostium and you have to tackle it. And also, if you have an ASOCT available. You can always use that because that will be totally atraumatic. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Do we have any other speakers? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. have. Dr. Technique of the sutureless phaco trap. As you know, the sutureless phaco trap of cataract surgery and glaucoma have very uh, varied ex deliberations among ophthalmologists. The concept was born way back in 1990s, and uh, we present a modality where we do the surgery by phacoemulsification trabeculectomy through the same tunnel. It being a time saver, it paves way of early rehabilitation in view of least dissection during the procedure. The study was done in Skins Medical College, Srinagar. 40 eyes of 40 consecutive patients were operated. All the intra and post-operative uh, sequence were studied. And uh, the combined procedure was done in borderline control with maximum tolerable medical treatment and significant cataract of the patients. 
and when two operations were not feasible at separate times. Improvement in the techniques have made such illustrate could have better in terms of success mm -hmm. rates mm -hmm. and post-op complications. Uh, Single approach was used. Fake emulsification, IL implantation was done uh, through uh, incision, which will become the site of the trabeculectomy uh, later. A phonic spaced conjectival flap was made. 2.8 to 3 mm incision horizontally was made in sclera. 2 to 3 millimeters from limbus was made. Advanced using crescent blade in the clear cornea from 1 to 1.5. So this was the horizontal around 2.5 incision, uh, around 2 millimeters from limbus and 1.5 in the cornea. Fecal emulsification was done, IOL implanted, sclera punch used to cut the inner flap, a overlying at least one millimeter was allowed at trabeculum site with the roof of the tunnel. So inner flap was cut with the at Cayley's punch, flap was left intact, peripheral iridectomy done, conductible suture, then uh, the video is not running. We started with the phaco emulsification as usual with the continuous curl railing. It's not, it's not coming here. Yeah, yeah. With the routine phaco emulsification and the routine CCC and updating the it's coming. So starting with the yeah, cyclical incision around two to uh, two point five millimeters from the limbus horizontally it's three millimeter one point five into the cornea. Then uh, starting with this routine hydro dissection and phaco emulsification. <laughs> So the chopping was done. So washing, uh, carefully taking all the material and putting the IUL, foldable IUL in the bag. So the the inner flap was cut with the Cali's punch, followed by. Uh, iridectomy. So this was around two punches horizontally, two punches vertically, just short of the posterior flap, posterior incision, just to prevent iris prolapse as well as the over filtration. So after this, we tested the free flow of the fluid, aqueous fluid. And uh, then finally, we close the conjunctiva with a single nylon 10 0 suture. So, this was the uh, picture of first post op day with the diffuse blab, iridectomy, and mostly the average age was 63, 67, no sex predominance, and pre-op pressure from 32, it went by six months, around 19 millimeters of mercury. So the drugs which a patient was using, around three drugs, it went almost to no drugs. So there was almost no complications. Blabs were visible in 36 cases, which were diffuse. Usual acuity improved up to 20 by 40. Advantages, 
the surgical manipulation and tissue trauma less absence of suture material leads to less fibrosis scarring rate for aqueous filtration tension and scleral flaps regulated by sutures in the conventional surgery leading to inter individual and inter procedural variations using intact scleral roof as in our case seems to be unique way of anatomically standardizing the fistula procedure critical amount of bulk flow is necessary to maintain patency of fistula with a single outflow channel as in our technique there are more chances of the fistula remaining patent than in the traditional method where random filtration occurs on either side of flaps conclusion the technique is simple safe reproducible effective way of combining fecal emulsification trabeculectomy that might lead to better filtration without the risk of other techniques moreover by decreasing the dependence of multiple glaucoma drugs reduces follow up visits of the patient coupled with improvement in visual acuity this procedure significantly improves the quality of the patient thank you very much thank you doctor so how many cases did you do like this around 20 cases and how often did you find a blood leak or a shallow ac post operative uh, not really and uh, you have i mean obviously you don't use mitomycin in any of these no, cases no not at all how Because could we yeah, use this is already a uh, totally an open okay. we, yeah, we, we didn't use we didn't use at all because you know with, with combined okay, usually okay. yeah because uh, almost none but it was uh, what i observed it was mostly good among 30 between 30 to 40 mm so high iops they were not controlled they needed additional drugs i mean it worked up to the between the pressures of 30 and 40 high pressures needed additional drugs post op anti glaucoma drugs they were open angle thank you, thank you very much So I'll be talking about uh, GATS, a case scenario. Uh, this is a case of a um, GATS advanced glaucoma. The 60 years old female uh, patient, uh, PAOG, and uh, she's on a, since 2000, she's on medication of course of Anfag and Zalatan. The patient is 66 and IOP is 2119. A CCD is low, 487 and 482. Gone is open angle and the point end cup in right eye and near total cup in left eye. This is the field of the patient and uh, advanced field with a narrow uh, tubular field with macular split and right eye compared to left eye and uh, so is the doctor is active practicing in doha and she is high teens iop low cct point n tubular field split fixation and refer for trap uh, what do you want to do i i thought i think travel cause a disaster for us because she's still active and she didn't come for the review and i just plan to do a faco guide for her so finish the faco then i, I put a Uh, use a six of six of proline, and then use a direct going to sonja come going to lens. Then I use a twenty four gauge needle to make an incision at the make a make incision at the anterior part of the posterior uh, topical measure. Then you then you just look at the slums canal. You can see the white line. The slums canal is visible. So once you know the slums canal, then you deepen the anterior chamber again with high high density viscoelastic. Then this is the one I use a mask three forceps. What the retina guys uses for uh, for eye lamp peeling, I use the forceps to tunnel this uh, uh, six of proline to the slums canal. So once you know the slums canal, you have some resistance. But once you cross more than 90 degrees, you are sure you can be in the Uh, it will not go very easily. It will be some resistance. It will be good indication that you are on a slum scanner. So once the suture comes 360 degree, you are happy. Then you can just then one can just see a suture other side. Then just pull it out. So then after that you just 
step of this follow the angle with the, the suture then you just wash the anti chamber with your ia then you hydrate and make the wound a little more tighter don't make it hypotony a tighter little bit of air bubble and little bit of tightness so then you close the wound so the post op uh, her process is 11 and 2 weeks and 9th and at the end of 6 months is a 10th because other eye now is on 18 with a maximum medication she came after after 6 months for other eye and we done other eye surgery also and at the end of the both eye surgeries at the end of 3 months follow up of both eye is 9 months right eye and after 3 months a process of 11 and 9 and then press currently on pilocar and azolamide the so case number 2 is a case of a gat in a zonal glaucoma the typical 25 years old girl zonal glaucoma with pressure of 41 and 28 Again, CC of 490 and 490 in both eyes, open angle, and a maximum medical of Ganford and Brinsall, and a poignant cup like this. We have advanced glaucoma like this, and the patient uh, the right eye is on 0.9 and left is 0.8, and this is the field effect of the patients. So I think a little bit of uh, the the the, the asphyxiation is near to the center expression of right eye, and compared to left eye, and this is the left eye field, and this is an OCD definitely shows the lot of never will also right eye compared to left eye so i <laughs> underwent trapped of mitomycin c and post operatively in 2 weeks 6 a 2 months a hypotomaclopathy the pressure is 4 double cataract so so we managed conservatively but after 3 months it comes with a pressure of 45 in other eye so now what do you want to do so this hypotomaclopathy one eye young patient and uh, so i just done a the hypotomaclopathy confirm the right eye so I uh, very high IOP, a pine head cup, and uh, what do you want to do for left eye? So I done a, a plain gat for her. So I just had a enter 2.2 incision. I just enter the anterior chamber, made a two side pour. This time when my suture from 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 the left side, I use a Swan Jacob lens. Then I look at my angle anatomy. Then I just look at my anterior the top of the lumbar make an incision. So that I deepen the I just dip that area. See the lumbar canal nicely. Then you just put the suture. Uh, six of pollen suture to the slums canal then use a masquery forceps to uh, guide the suture in so once you get the suture it, it goes without uh, the, the suture has to go little little firm not very loose not very tight so if it is very loose then means you are going to supercular space if it too tight means some other space so once you get this to the you can see a suture other, other side so once you get the suture in uh, see then you just pull the suture out then you rip Three sixty degree of trabeculomy shot. So once you done the face, and then again you just wash it off with your irrigation IA. Then form the form the chamber tight. So her her post op or uh, the, the, the day one or uh, day one week is twelve in left eye. The right in right eye is three minutes because hypermaculopathy. One month is eleven, and the three in one month post op because hypermaculopathy. So the case number three we are also learning in a PACG in angle cause of glaucoma. This is a nurse who came with angle cluster glaucoma with a with a cyanical angle cluster glaucoma. So we started exploring. This is use a tenetos micro hook. You know, use a tenetos micro hook to do the gonio cyanicalysis. We just remove the cyanicae. So this is a big pass in the temporal side. So on the other side, then this remove the tenetos micro hook. Remove this big pass. So once you remove the big pass, then you are sure that your your cyanicae closure uh, has taken care. Then you use a Swan Jacob lens. Then you use a uh, high viscosity solution. Then you look at the anterior part of the trabecular muscle. Make an incision there. Then you just deep, then deep that area. Then you see a slums canal. Then you just thread it off. It's the more more happiest thing when you when you see a especially such a other side, especially the angle of the angle of the glaucoma, because one thing is the less complication of of trabeculectomy, and you can you can take out the lens. You can give a pressure reduction of. Less than 15 with a single medication, they are much happy, and you are much happy. No, just pull the suture out, and this way, we are also learning in a in a GAT in a PACG cases, and uh, the more more interesting to do in a, in a PACG. So these are the things I use now. I use a I use a Swan Jacob lens, then I use a, a low power cartridge, then I use a masquery forceps. Then I use a 24 gauge needle to make incision. Then I use a I use a high density like we use a Arajal Plus 
1.6 mole sodium hydroxide for forming the anti chamber now even the risk would over the cornea just to uh, for the coupling solution then is 6 of proline so i conclude get the promising initial tool for for jvg and pvg even in ice with advanced visual field loss get is possible even in pacg high fever is only the most common complex course of complications need to take care has high safety profile and long term iop control and also long term learning curve thank you there was a beautiful um, uh, video assisted uh, presentation just a few questions do you leave these patients on pilocarpine post operatively yeah i leave it for at least for 6 months to 1 yeah. year 6 months to 1 year second question did you see any incidence of pass formation uh we don't see pass formation but we see high fever little high bit high fever of course one and yeah. what about long term iop do you get scarring eventually in the angle making the uh, functionality of your trabeculotomy see a lot of people are still responders we don't see any of pass causing high high, high pressure mm. mostly young patients still are responders they not right. like a trap we put on eight times we report only four times okay in spite of some sometime they have a, if they have some high fever post op they are mostly high responders Mm. So we just put him on a pilot car. Only thing is, we're worried about high fever. High fever part is taken care. I think things mm. are really good. And do you burn the leading tip of the suture yeah, to uh, make like we, the we guiding? We make a low power car. We just make it a blend. I depend mm. upon. I make it very small mushroom. Mushroom. Some yeah. people make it big. I make it very small. Next to the angle of the glaucoma, I make it very small. Yeah. And the angle of the glaucoma patients are very very happy. What about uh, how often do you not manage to cannulate the entire 360 degree Schlem scan? I think yeah, I think first three months we are you know, I think we and my colleagues are tried that I think now we are most of them 100 and 100. Because 100. I find that a challenge. Very often you cannot really come back. Yeah, if you're not, I think initially you have problem. Like initially, I think I think I'm, I'm just saying it much easier than Faco. How mm. how all of us learn Faco from SSH to Faco. I think all mental block we have. We have a lot of troubles. I think it's much easier. The only thing is be patient and you will look at the angle. And if you're not able to do 360 degrees, still you can do tenet or micro hook to to complete this uh, uh, this case. Beautiful surgery. And uh, how many cases would you have done? I think since uh, three months, I think both of us not done. Back, back. We just we just shook to uh, uh, get since uh, since Jan. Gat for all. Not gat for all. <laughs> no trap. <laughs> no trap. <laughs> Just one question that for uh, PACG huh? patients, huh? Dr. Mohinudin, yeah. for PACG patients you had released the synechia. Yeah. So if they, I mean, it may not be possible for releasing the synechia 360 degrees. I mean, jitne synechia. But I think once you go to canal, you have to release all of them before you. I just do. with the big pass, I just release it. If there is only a pass in the nasal quadrant, I just release it and put a suture to the sarms canal. So that will once it goes to the canal, it comes out. Only problem is that sometimes iris will be floppy, especially for especially for angles of the glaucoma. Iris will be coming out, so we need to because we will we'll be putting a lot of visco uh, to deepen that angle. But the temporal side, the iris will keep coming out. That's one problem. Sometimes I make a small hole because of mental manipulation. The small temporal side hole will be there. But you, I think, I think as you as you grow, uh, the more the more cases you do, the more cases you do. I think it's much. I think all of us will sometime will turn to go to get. Contract. How will it compare with bang? I don't know. So. Bang is the one all of us learn in bang. So all of us are all of us initially we saw the angle. We just use we all learn. Once you get this feel of putting a suture to the slums canal, once you get this is a degree out, you are a faculty surgeon like we say a gas surgeon. <laughs> so uh, are there any cases in which you say, said no, I won't do it? No, we uh, I think we we told we will not do trap. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the instrument that you are using it seems to be totally under your control it's a mascari force of the retina case uses the retina case is used for, for island peeling which company i um, uh, elcon elcon island peeling okay i think i'll get from retina colleagues they'll be using right and left you can get from them slowly can use it up yeah thank you so much for yeah. your lovely yeah. talk yeah. next talk we have dr dina ha yeah. yeah. yes for pass you may have the pass in the get especially in the fake think we have any cases but fake guys we have to we have to be careful especially when dealing with the juvenile angle glaucoma they develop the pass but uh, again the key of course that continue pilocarp for longer period of time 3 to 4 month you won't get that pass yeah one next we have dr reena ji and it was a pleasure watching the previous presentation um, so yeah there i am So I'll be talking about eye stent. We've already heard uh, Dr. Sahiban talk about it. So some of it might be um, okay. Is it working? Sorry, it's not working here. Can you just look at it? 
my cursor is not showing to cancel this ah finally it's yahan pe chal raha hai wait yahan pe open karte hai now let's is it working now sorry about this yeah Yeah, finally, I think now it's working. So I'll be talking about ice tent, and I think basically to just introduce that in primary open angle glaucomas, we basically treat our patients it's medically, and problem. in some cases we offer the laser, basically in the form of SLT or ALT, and then straight away the second options available or further options available are surgeries like trabeculectomy or tubes and shunts, which are offered in the slightly moderate to severe disease when you can't control the pressures or patients cannot. Uh, use the topical medications. So we also know that medications, the challenges of compliance, cost, multiple drugs, quality of life, and if you look at basically the um, stepwise approach, the surgeries offered in traditional ways are basically trabeculectomy, the gold standard, and the traps and tubes. But in mild to moderate disease, we are primarily limited to our drugs. But now, in the last few years, we have the MIGS platform showing up, where we are looking at. the uh, possibility of offering some procedures to lower the intraocular pressure in mild to moderate uh, cases of glaucoma uh, this is just to highlight the challenges sometimes with topical medication and now the threshold is becoming much lower to offer a surgical option in patients where you have multiple drugs requirement so mmt which was first considered four drugs in you know maybe three bottles or two bottles now it's pretty much in many surgeons eyes is limited to about three drugs in two bottles so uh we also know that these drugs have their own challenges not just compliance but the fluctuations of iop is a problem systemic side effects local side effects in the eye and of course sometimes it's uh, the cost and otherwise also the effect on the ocular surface that these patients do not comply very often to the required treatment so this was an article uh, by dr sunita dubey et al um, at the shroff charity delhi and they also documented that in indian scenario 50% of the patients do offer us full compliance with the remaining 50 are either, either partially compliant or not compliant at all we also know that the fluctuations do affect the visual field progression as documented in this very popular uh, study by asrani et al and of course the ocular surface disorders with the drugs uh, is something that we see every day in our clinic and we know these patients are very much affected by the symptoms of the ocular surface rather than the problem of glaucoma so that is also a problem that we should be attending to So what we are talking about is that MIGS is here now, and it's here to stay. We already heard uh, um, just now a presentation on cannulating the Schlem's canal. There are other procedures that we are all doing, whether it is GAT or we are doing trabec uh, trabectomies. We are using, we are doing the eye stent. So in my talk, I limit myself to basically the eye stent and eye stent. inject which comes in between your first two stages which is the medical management of trabeculoplasty and before you offer a trabeculectomy so basically you're talking about mild to moderate disease dr sahiban already um, illustrated the indications for eye stent basically mild to moderate disease where you're looking at reduction of medications by a single drop or two drops lowering the pressures by about 20 to 30% and these are eyes which are not vulnerable which do not have advanced disease and of course open angle is a mandatory requirement for this procedure to succeed so angle close your eyes or any secondary glaucomas are contraindicated this is how the eye stent looks like which has a head and a thorax and a flange and it's a titanium made um uh, implant which is coated by heparin and the eye inject injector is it comes with two of these implants loaded onto the same uh, trocar so this is just to show you what it looks like this is the trocar which is loaded with it and you have you can inject two in uh, uh, implants at the same sitting in every patient about 2 o'clock hours away into the trabecular meshwork so the head basically goes into the schlem's canal the thorax is sitting in the trabecular meshwork and the flange is what is seen in the anterior chamber this is just a short video to show what it looks like you already saw with dr saib on the trocar actually punctures the trabecular meshwork you indent it a little bit and you press on to the plunger and you click the uh, implant to go and sit in that position and you can also tap on it to make sure that it's sitting and it's not under uh, implanted or over implanted and i'll talk about it once i show you my detailed um, next video and you ideally want to see these two implants about 2 clock hours away 
and uh, very often you will have reflux uh, bleeding from these uh, implants which is very normal and it settles down quickly. You can use any direct gonioscope in the operation theater. Swan Jacob works very well, but you also have this iPRISM SX that the company is providing along with the uh, eye stent inject, which works very well. So you can choose whatever works well in your hands. But the important thing is before you move on to doing the eye stents, one has to learn to visualize the angle on the table. And that's the first thing that you have to learn to do. Even in routine cases, you can try and um, understand how is it that you will learn to see the angles well. Basically, you have to tilt your microscope about more than 35 degrees, somewhere about 40 to 60 degrees towards yourself. Basically, the optics are moving away from you. And then you adjust your oculars to make sure that you're able to see the microscope in that angle and tilt the patient's head in the opposite direction by the same degrees so that then you are aligned to the angle and you want an on fast image of the angle. This is just a video to show you that I'm sitting here and now I'm, my assistant is moving the uh, uh, this thing to dial to try and tilt the microscope. You can see that it's already tilted a little bit. Can you see this paper mark on the microscope? That is about 50 to 60 percent. So I'm telling him to tilt some more. He keeps tilting till I know that I've achieved a tilt required to get a non-fast image. Once I have it, you can see the ocular has moved down from my eyes. And in this microscope, I can just tilt my oculars up. In case you can't do it in the microscope you have, you can always adjust your chair to achieve that. Then you turn the patient's head in the opposite direction. So you talk to the patient and say that I'm just tilting it. And now you have a good view of the angle the moment you'll put the gonio prism onto the eye. And now you can see that I'm putting a high molecular weight viscoelastic onto the cornea and I'll take the gonioscope in my hand and just put it onto the uh, nasal side of the cornea and you'll be able to see the angle through the microscope and I will so that that's the gonio prism and you go and you put it there and you're able to see the angle immediately. So this procedure I think we already saw that but just to elaborate a little bit you want to use sodium hyaluronate because it sits well onto the cornea and gives you a good interface between the lens and the cornea. And then you go and this is the gonio prism that I'm talking about. You go and put it onto the peripheral cornea. It works very well. There's no indentation and you can have a very good high resolution image of the angle. The moment you have it, you make sure that your tilt is adequate to get the on fast image, maybe just a minute or so. And you can minimize it to in, take your injector in. It is covered with a sleeve. The moment you cross the pupil and you're inside the eye, you can retract the sleeve with a plunger and then you can go and touch the angle and implant your eye stents. You can see the trocar is sitting within the tube and there's a window on top of the tube so that you can see what is happening. Once you see the uh, trabecular meshwork well, you go, let the trocar enter the trabecular meshwork and just have a little indentation and press onto the plunger to launch the implant and you can see a little bit of blood refluxing there you go on and inject the second eye inject in the same manner and then you can use a viscoelastic which you'll just see to wash away or disperse the blood and make sure that your stents are sitting well in case you feel it's under implanted you can use the same injector and tap it a little and push it further down for it to sit ideally into the Schlem's canal see now I've just used a viscoelastic and you can see well so just to say that basically you are increasing the flow through the collector channels and just can I take 30 sec uh, one minute more Dr. Minakshi okay so as you can see over here this is basically an angiographic study of an eye before the eye stent and then after you put the eye stent you'll be able to see the okay after you'll see that in the areas where the eye stents are sitting the amount of filtration happening is significantly more. You can also see it if you use stripe and blue on the table that after you inject these uh, implants, the dye will start getting into your subconjunctival tissue. So basically all these ab internal, all these MIGS procedures are basically ab internal so that you don't touch the conjunctiva, it's minimally invasive and you're also leaving behind pretty much 85% of your trabecular meshwork untouched, actually 98% for any further uh, intervention if required and your conjunctiva is also untouched and the chances of pass formation or endothelial cell loss in this MIGS is hardly reported. So uh, as I also mentioned that it's a conjunctival sparing procedure so a future 
possibility of trab or tubes is not hampered in the subset of patient there's a lot of published data with eye stent because it's been used now for many years globally but in india now in the last um, uh, one and a half two years we have patients uh, who have been uh, subjected to inject and we'll have more and more data being published this is a very large study by hengerers and you can see they were talking about 20 to 35 percent reduction in this subset of patients whether you combine it with FACO, you do it alone and also 71 percent medical redu medication reduction in these patients with, le with lesser fluctu iop fluctuation so the ocular surface also improves in many of these patients because the requirement of the drugs goes down significantly so just to summarize eye stent is a good option available to us for our patients requiring a, let's say a cataract surgery in mild to moderate um, glaucoma primarily the open angle eyes and it's basically by passing your uh, trabecular meshwork to have the fluid get into the collector channels through these eye stent injects and it does have very less risk and an added benefit the cost still remains a huge challenge but i think in the time to come we are only going to see more and more implants and maybe even the cost will become a little more viable although the insurance companies now are helping us be able to inject these in our patients uh, with glaucoma and sometimes very often my i think indications of patients who have open angle glaucoma mild to moderate with one or two drugs and they need a cataract surgery that's the time to offer this procedure to them so thank you if there's any question i'm happy to take that what does it uh, ideally cost the patient so you know you're adding about ninety thousand rupees extra to your cataract package when you offer an eye stent even more some people are even charging more depending upon how much it is an expensive uh, tool right now is mr psychic is here he can comment a little more on it uh, but yes it is an expensive preposition but insurances are giving it and there are some of us i think dr amit has been using a lot and is able to get in delhi ncr because of gypsa there is a little bit of a challenge but i think more and more now people are open to the idea that they will go up to the insurance companies to reimburse it you know later initially they pay up what extra they have to so it's working it's working but i mean there is that roadblock with the cost and in the learning curve to master it how long did it take? i think did if you have any fall yeah so of course with any procedure there can be a learning curve but generally technically this is not a difficult procedure to do at all it might look because you if you start doing it i think it's a matter of just a few a couple so of you procedures. never lost any no i'll tell you what if it drops it's very easy to rethread it and especially if there is a sodium to hyaluronate find it? no while you're doing it see as we also were discussing before the session started if you lose it later which you hardly will then it's a different story but if under visualization on the table you've seen it dropping you pick it up you rethread it you put it again if you have put it in well you tap it you can actually go tap it it's quite nicely fixated over there and you're doing an ia if it doesn't move out then it's not going to move out thereafter no but uh, yes a learning curve and all sometimes also getting an on fast image i think we don't realize sometimes that you want the trabecular meshwork really perpendicular if the tilt is not adequate and if you can see the angle but it's not on fast then really getting into the schlems canal is a problem you might be tangential to the trabecular meshwork so the ideal placement might not happen so anatomically you have to just learn to get the nicest image and the angulation go up to almost 50 to 60 degrees don't stop at 35 i think that's the key to have a higher tilt so that it's a little difficult if you don't have your eyepiece uh, you can't lift it then you have to kind of bend down move back to be able to and your hand length will increase to access now you will be sitting a little further away but these are small modifications you will quickly adapt to and if the moment the trabecular meshwork is perpendicular and you want to inject perpendicular to it it will launch into the schlem's canal the Anything, cost does it, uh, just, yes. does it get blocked with blood or you know the because it's heparin coated the... because it's heparin coated usually that's not an issue it's not, not an, an issue. issue yeah so the not cost, that I cost is uh, for the gen 1 uh, is 69000 uh, is the mrp and for the gen 2 is i think one close to 1. 1.5 uh, and uh, that's the MRP and uh, I think the hospital rate would be lesser, much lesser. And uh, uh, I've done eye stents, I've done almost 17 now, including uh, eye stent Gen 1 and Gen 2. And almost 13 or 14 of my patients have been either fully or partially covered under insurance. 
so uh, that's something yet there is no capping on uh, these implants so, so thank you we can take that yeah. advantage you have a question thank you very much for that insightful presentation uh, my question is, do you have uh, preferences for the quadrants that you start with? Yeah, so basically if you're making a temporal incision, that's what you're used to. You're implanting it in the nasal side because you have to implant it in the opposite direction. But if you're familiar with the superior incisions and all, sure, you can do it. But I primarily do it in the nasal side, which means you're accessing it from the temporal side. Okay, why well, so ask that question is based on the, you know, the anatomy of the angle with regards to the collector channels where Correct. we have so the nasal the and the inferior nasal yeah. area is the largest best. amount of collector channels that you have so it's best to always do it even if you have done a superior phaco uh, you have a temporal side port so you change your position go through the uh, temporal side port and inject nasally nasal and inferior nasal is the ideal uh, area that you need to inject it yes. yeah thank you very much uh, doctor, would you introduce yourself? You've been asking very great questions. Uh, my name is Professor Adeola Onokoya. I'm from Lagos University Hospital, Nigeria. Welcome Thank to you. India. Thank you. Thank you. Comments. But will we be able to do it inferiorly also? I mean, tilt will be possible because you have to... No, no. The tilt, tilt has to be opposite only. You're sitting temporarily, one bang nasally, and one two clock hours inferiorly. But not in no, 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 so not you yet. can't sit superior no. and do it, right? No. You have to be temporal only. Intranasal. You can't. Huh? That's the uh, inject. One one question that I had. Uh, Dr. Siddharth in LV Prasad, he sits superiorly. And the patient is normally like this only. So he doesn't have to do more of inferior tilting. So he sits superior and he's very tall. So he gets, because of his height, he, he sits on the superior side and already the patient is like this. He tilts the microscope and just sees the he he does GAT from the superior side. He sits on the superior side. So he is he sees that. But also I saw some videos will show you topical movement. Huh. One, one observation that I am having with my MIGS is that uh, post-operatively uh, these patients are uh, more number of these patients are having steroid response and the steroid response is quite quick normally steroid response takes a few weeks to start but here even uh, in the first week we are seeing steroid response and that has been observed uh, i think worldwide uh, the last and ap you're using uh, predacetate not difluprid no 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 i am okay. using dexamethasone a combination dexamethasone and uh, moxifloxacin uh, almost equal to what you have in POAG patients or it is more no, than... No, it's much more than that and much more quicker. And there's something that is being researched. I, I, I had this discussion in uh, 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 Kuala Lumpur as well uh, where they are, they are saying that the steroid response is happening probably what we have been taught is that trabecular meshwork getting clogged by the, uh, the gags and uh, the uh, proteins. Uh, uh, but something is happening beyond the trabecular meshwork in the collector channels and the Schlems canal as well. Uh, I don't know if ma'am is seeing uh, in, in GAT patients also, you're seeing steroid response. So this needs to be uh, I think it kept in yeah, mind. Some food for thought for us to yeah. come exactly. back and meet again. So you need to call these patients a little more closely, follow up, because you might see these patients uh, with a steroid response. And we need to taper off uh, steroids quite quickly in them. I, I can keep such patient on the non steroidal also because you run the phaco surgery, you can non steroidal. And I want to point out one thing you talk about the nasal angle. Why nasal angle? Because the outer collector channel is more in the nasal angle. That's yes. why it's preferred, not because uh, 30 to 40 percent, around the 30 to 40 percent outer collector channel in the nasal area. Yes. That's why we are targeting the nasal angle. If you want to do, it's preferable to do the supranasal or infranasal. These are the height. I probably is one diagram. Is a nice diagram. You see the outer maximum outer channel lives lies on the nasal area. That's why we prefer to the nasal. Thank you so much and for your input. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah apart, apart from this uh, uh, steroid responder, steroid responder is especially more common with the younger age group in compared to the older age group. And what I used to do my practice, give the steroid for one week and put into the non-steroidal later on. So your problem will be solved.
uh, with that i think we'll come to a close it's 12 o'clock and we i hope you uh, we enjoyed the session i hope you did too thank you so much thank you